Okay, well, hello everybody. Um, my name is Katherine Reinhardt. I just want to give a huge thank you to the Anderson Gallery, to Emily and Julia for making all of this happen, um, and a big thanks to you guys for coming to this Take Care session. So, um, what we'll do today is I can only stand about like one hour of Zoom. I don't know if y'all are with me on that. And so we're gonna keep it kind of brief. Um, and first I'm gonna give you a little sort of presentation about my work and my background. And I'll talk about the, some of the pieces in this show that I have. Um, and then I'll also share some sort of resources that I've been researching through with this project. Um, and the genesis of the collective mending sessions. So, um, yeah, I will just share my screen. And then after that little thing, we can um, get ready to do the take care session. And that's when we'll get out our quilt blocks and get all comfortable and, and I'll sort of lead us in that. Um, and I just want to say this is a new territory for me doing this in this format. And so um, I'm so glad that we're all here trying this out and all of the tech, all of its tech glory. So hopefully this all works out. But if there's any snags, um, thanks in advance for your patience. Um, we're all trying to figure stuff out. And I love doing that with other people. So. Um, okay, I will share my screen now. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks for the thumbs up. I like seeing, I like seeing, being able to see you too. Okay, my name is Katherine Reinhardt and I am a interdisciplinary artist and I make um, fiber art works on paper and I conduct socially engaged projects using mostly abandoned textiles, um, specifically quilts. I live and work in Ames, Iowa, so I'm not far from you guys, um, and have two kids ages seven and three. Um, okay, I am so excited to have these next pieces in this show. I saw them in the video. To a little bit close to you guys. Yeah. Um, so these two pieces are part of my, I call them artifacts. One is artifact shirt and the other is artifacts undies. And these are part of um, what this body of work I call the topography of dwelling. And um, it's a body of work that I am trying to sort of be both um, archivist and field hand. And so I'm investigating the landscape of my home and sort of mapping the terrain of the domestic place. And so um, one thing, being a fiber artist about the, the home place that I really sort of connect with is laundry and the piles of laundry and the process of sorting and um, just so, sort of processing the laundry. And so um, I was looking at maps and thinking about laundry. And so these pieces, I took my kids dirty laundry. So this one is one of his shirts, my son's shirt. And these are his toddler training underwear. <laughs> and I use those and trace them and use them as sort of the template and then made the topographical map, um, the elevation line drawings um, from there. And so this is one way I'm attempting to sort of map my ex experience as a mother. So my, and my experience as like being a stay at home mom and an artist both simultaneously. Um, and I think especially during this pandemic, it's become really, heightened, you know, that we're all in our home place. And so I think that I try to think of, I'm trying to think of 
the home and um, my place and sort of these limitations that were set not as barriers but as boundaries and how I can make work you know using the boundaries that are set in place right now so it's sort of like trying to be it's sort of like a hopeful way to generate art out of maybe not an ideal situation um, or just a really challenging one um, and I found motherhood and parenting to be pretty challenging, <laughs> um, but, but very, gro you know, a growth process. Um, this up piece is also in the show, and um, the title of this piece, it's a diptych, so it's a two sculpture um, piece, and the title is my kids' initials, and then um, the date, which is 3-13-2020. And um, these sculptures sort of represent this ritual that we have that's really permeates popular culture and just sort of permeates the, the architecture and the place of building a home, I think, is this ritual of marking heights against a wall. You know, we see that a lot. A lot of people do that in their own homes when they live there for a long time. They sort of record the initials and the dates of their children and then as they as they grow over. And so it's this passage of time. And so I have never actually done that, but this sculpture is sort of my uh, artistic representation of that ritual. And so these are the heights of my three-year-old son and my seven-year-old daughter on 3 13 2020 that I have made into these sculptures and then filled with thread. And I was also, you know, looking at the domestic landscape and the architecture of the home and ritual as sort of an archive of living, but I was also looking to layers of soil and core samples and, you know, um, the power of that deep time as well and sort of the larger passage of time. Emily has some really great curators notes if you haven't watched the um, uh, the reception her talk so she she talked about these pieces too so definitely go back. Um, and so I will talk a little bit about these take care sessions and I just want to take some time to acknowledge the state we are all living in. This year has been quite a heavy one. My friend said it, it was relentless. And I feel like um, every day I wake up in some, some other hard thing is on the news. And um, so this, body of work this take care session is really one of my attempts to um, sort of give people tools to combat the the really the isolation and despair that we're maybe all feeling or have felt in the past months and so one thing that I really believe is that um, textile and slow stitch processes like mending or like repairing um, textiles or even just like taking time to slow down and look at what needs to be fixed is a really powerful um, it's a really powerful metaphor for the work that needs to like happen in our lives and in our society and in our political system but it's also just um, a really good ritual and practice for for people to combat stress. So um, a little bit of background about the collective mending sessions. I started this a couple years ago. I was given a quilt by my mother and it was my quilt from when I was a kid, when I was a teenager and going into college, I moved away to college and I told her to throw it away. And she didn't because she is a wiser than me, as most mothers are. <laughs> and she kept it and she gave it to me two years ago. And um, I just know, knew I needed to repair it. It was really tattered. But I 
it was such a big job. I just could not do it by myself, you know, and I, that's a metaphor in itself for what's happening in the world today. And so I said, well, I would love to get people together. So over the next two years from 2018 to right before the pandemic, um, I was leading these workshops where I would teach mending and we'd all sit around and we would mend together. So we would build community um, and we would learn um, how to repair and take care of textiles. Um, all skill levels welcome. I didn't, I, it ended up being a lot of women who would come. I didn't have too many men, but I did have some, some um, guys who were first time stitchers. And um, I think these processes and processes like knitting too, um, can be really therapeutic, no matter your sex, age, or skill level. And so I think, um, you know, to try a new thing is a good, is a good thing in any time of life. Um, this is not a great image, but um, I want to talk about the history of textiles for a second. This is a large um, friendship sampler piece quilt from Ohio. You see it here. Um, this um, was made by a group and so each person in the group did a block and so it's sort of like a sampler um, and this is what I'm doing for this next session. So you guys have been given like a quilt block and that's a quilt I, I cut up and then we're going to stitch on them together and then eventually when all the mending sessions are done in about a year I'll collect those pieces and then make a, a quilt. And so this practice is not, is not new. And so people have been doing this for a long time. There's a history. A lot of these are like friendship quilts. Um, a lot of them were given as gifts um, to pastors or preachers. And so the parish congr or congregants would work on blocks and then give them as a gift. Um, to a leader in the community. Also, there's a really interesting, um, I'll go back maybe, there's, I'll talk about this a little bit, there's an interesting history actually of quilts and textiles being signed by women who were in groups who were during the suffrage movement and during the um, sort of labor the labor rights fight too. And so um, women, there in particular, there's a really some powerful textiles where all women would sign their name, would stitch their names onto napkins um, when they were imprisoned for um, protesting. And so they, and, and they, um, yeah, so so these sort of like collaborative textiles and um, people working on something together and like contributing a piece or a part or signing their name to a textile and then it being the it being this like signifier of solidarity is is really historically embedded in quilt make, quilt making. Um, this is an image of my life during the pandemic. So I personally, when it started, I found a lot of um, comfort and care. You know, I couldn't do much else. I couldn't make art really. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to do with my kids. They were going crazy. Um, but what brought me a lot of comfort was just darning my socks. And so this is an image of um, when you darn a sock, you see the threadbare part and you, I am reinforcing that with stitches that go um, north and south with my long, beautiful darning needle. And then um, the stitches next that go at a diagonal. So I really found a lot of comfort from and stress relief in stitching and in slowly repairing my own garments and the garments of other people. 
And so I really believe in the value of that. Um, I mentioned earlier this sort of history of protests um, and textiles, and I read about that in the Subversive Stitch, which is a fantastic um, uh, book about the history of embroidery and, and feminism. And it was written, I think, first in 1984, um, but uh, they just released this nice cover with this edition. So I, if you want to read anything further about feminism and the history of embroidery in particular, um, I would highly recommend this book. And then here is an image. Um, I've also been looking at um, these protest banners and suffrage banners, which were mostly made out of cloth. And this image in particular um, was really powerful, I think, too, because it just it like expressed um, their their mourning and really this sort of like drive to put on display, you know, this loss and this grief. And so I um, I think too that maybe this process of stitching and and um, textile is bound up in how we collectively grieve. And I think, especially in light of, um, you know, the everything that's been happening this year, um, we need avenues of grieving and we need to, you know, we need tools and ways which we can grieve with each other and which we can do that personally. And I think that stitching can be that. So, Okay, and here's just the last slide, which is just information. If you want to know more about the mending sessions, I do have a website just devoted to that project and um, an Instagram. And then I included my um, sort of my personal um, ways to find me online too. So um, that's about all I have on that. I will stop sharing. So do please connect with me on there. Um, I would love to, you know, send me a message and, and um, I really love, you know, meeting you guys in person. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, now we can, we can get started on the take care session. So what I'm going to give you guys a chance to do is just, um, get out your materials and don't you don't have to hurry you can just take your time and um what's a good rule is when you're in doing embroidery is um find a place you like being that you're relaxed and not super distracted um oh cue the lights that's good you do need to have some good light when you're doing any kind of stitching because um, if you do a lot of it over time in dim light, it can really do a number on your eyes. So, um, do that. And I'm just gonna, you know, I'll wait. Maybe Julia can give me a thumbs up when everyone seems like comfortable and I can start the, the take care session. Oh, thanks for, I see there's one person joining us on, in your, wherever you are, on the, on, on Zoom, <laughs> not in the gallery, so thanks for coming too. Luke, I hope that's Luke. Yep, that's me. Mm -hmm. Yay, I'm glad you're here. And you don't, okay, so to begin, you don't need your needles ready. You can sort of, I want you to have your quilt block. So um, you can, yay, Julia, yeah. So you can have your quilt block. Um, I've got mine here. But you don't need to have your needles because we're gonna start off, um, and I sort of start these take care sessions a little bit differently. So I'll start off with a poem, actually, a fantastic 
poem and then we're just going to do sort of an exercise a meditative exercise in um looking hmm. let me find my let me get ready here too Okay, are we, we're good, okay. I will switch, so I'm going to switch to, so you guys can see the quilt, which is like much prettier than my own face. Okay, so, oh, with this, you guys can just relax, make sure you're, um, Make sure your feet, like if you're sitting on a chair, make sure your feet are touching the floor. Um, if you're, sit, sometimes I do embroidery and I just sit on the ground. So if you're sitting on the ground, just make sure you relax your shoulders and take a few deep breaths. And I'll begin with um, a poem I read every time I start a mending session or uh, the take care sessions. And so this is a poem from the great Mary Oliver, who was really good at paying attention to many things, including nature. And so this poem is called Mindful. Every day I see or I hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It is what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy, in acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab. The daily presentations, oh good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these, the untrimmable light of the world, the ocean shine, the prayers that are made out of grass. And I read that really because one important part of taking care of textiles is learning how to notice things. And I think her poems in particular really help me to know the value of looking and looking long and deep and sort of um, slowly at things. And so what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna do an exercise in looking. And so we're gonna look at our quilt block. So. Um, just get in a really comfortable place and I'll lead you through that. Let's see, we'll do that for about five minutes. And so this can seem like a really long time if you, I, I mean, it always does to me, but <laughs> I promise it is so good. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to look at your quilt blocks and during this, do remember um, your breath. So make sure you're keeping your breath big. Um, and those would be like breathing out for about four seconds and then breathing in for about five or six. And just making sure the pace of your breath is just really smooth. And you're going to observe your textile with all, all of your senses. So that means you can look at it 
look at um, the patterns, look at, you know, I always see maps and textiles. So look at the ridges, look at the boundaries, look at the seams. In these quilt blocks, someone has fantastic, done some fantastic hand sewing on each of these triangles, which is just so much work. And you can think about the amount of time and attention that goes into making all of these tiny little stitches all of that labor put in by someone I don't I don't know who made this quilt. It's an unknown, unknown person. Look at where the stitches are coming out. This quilt was kind of is in pretty good shape, so you might not have any areas where it's really been torn or um, in need of repair, and that's okay too. Some other areas in this quilt were had some had some damage in them. You can flip it over to the back and notice the pattern of stitching and what it does to the fabric from the front to the back. You can, you know, touch it. I always try to guess, you know, is this all one kind of um, fiber? So is, is it all cotton or does some of it look like it was silk or, you know, maybe it was taken from a garment or maybe they, you know, you can make up. What I love is that in a lot of these old textiles, there's all these stories in them, you know, maybe these were kids clothes that someone cut up, or maybe they just bought the yardage from the store, or it's an interesting exercise in using your imagination too. Sometimes, a lot of times, I like smell them too, so I know it's a little weird, <laughs> but if you want to, I did wash these, so they shouldn't smell that bad, but um, look at the edges where I cut, look at the layers of the quilt, the material, how it's constructed together. That's an important thing to notice. Looks like this has a flannel inner inner piece. Okay, we have about two more minutes and I'm gonna stop talking. And you can just keep, try to keep looking.
Okay. Five minutes is up. Sometimes I, I like to have people take notes after we do that exercise. It's interesting, like what thoughts come up. Um, and you know, it's hard to share. It's hard. I, if, if I was there with you in the room, <laughs> I would have everyone share sort of what they, what things came to mind or what parts they like of their quilt block, of their textile. So um, I guess when, when I come to a piece of cloth to start working on something, here, maybe I'll switch to my, <laughs> when I come to a textile, I, um, I, I like the fact that there's already a lot of, of meaning in the textile already. So um, one thing maybe that I'll encourage you guys to do before we start some stitching is that um, maybe a good place to start is just notice the area that you were drawn to the most in the textile. Maybe it was a color you liked, or maybe it was interesting pattern. Maybe it was a place that was really ripped or torn and you want to fix it. Um, and, and I suggest that's where you, you know, you begin your stitching. So, um, Certainly there's like different ways we can approach this and like I'm probably not going to give you too many lessons this in this format because that's a little hard to teach you the stitches but I Julia has some handouts that have some great like technical um, like how to darn and how to do a patch and how to repair your textiles. Um, and so a lot of this project too is just giving people agency to like learn those skills on your own. And so I just encourage people and I'm gonna encourage you guys to like jump right in with these quilt blocks today and just start stitching, but it'll be really hard for me to show you stitches like uh, on here. <laughs> I'm sure Emily is like way better at this since she's probably been teaching online, <laughs> but I have, I have not been. Um, but all that to say, we're just going to jump in and we're going to thread our needles and we're going to start stitching with a, whatever little stitches you know. Um, I will switch to my video. And this is like a low stakes game, right? Like feel free to start your stitches. Um, if you mess up, that's fine. Um, if you can't get something right, I'm sure, you know, oh. Can you show us your, yes, there we yeah. go. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so I think Emily gave you some embroidery hoops. So this one I have is a, is a metal one. Um, and just how you use them. What I'm going to do is, I don't know if you can see it, I have a little rip here. And instead of me repairing it, like instead of me closing, closing the wound, if you will, I kind of don't want to do that. I want to make it really obvious that it, it's um, torn here. So I, and that's just a choice I'm going to make, like that's where I want to start. So I am going to put my embroidery hoop on. A lot of the times when I'm stitching, I actually don't use a hoop, especially when I'm stitching on like a giant quilt, just because it's really, I don't know. Um, but in the beginning, when you're just learning how to do some stitches, it's nice to have, um, 
the hoop to keep things tight and to not have to manage, um, not have to manage your textile with the other hand. Yes, Emily and Julia for helping. I, with two little kids, being there in person is super difficult because I have no, I have no childcare. So um, we are just gonna make this work and um, yeah, I'll be, I'll just be quiet here for a little while while they help you guys with your hoops. Mine has a spring. So mine is, um, mine is metal and it has this cork. This part is cork here. And what I do is I just put that back piece inside under the area where I want to stitch so you can kind of see where it is. And then this is the other part of my hoop and my hoop has got a, it's like a tension. This is like a spring, but a lot of wooden hoops would also have a screw that you unscrew to make it a little bit bigger. And then you, I find it easy to put them on one side and then continue on. Like you're putting on a jar, you know, like a lid. So like start in one place and then just press them on through the whole thing. And sometimes I don't even bother with a hoop. So if, if it's giving you trouble, I don't know. <laughs> sometimes I don't like using them. I know, ideally- we are almost would... there, Catherine. Hold on just a second. Oh no, it's fine. We have wooden hoops with the screw and so it's, yeah, the to, it's a little challenging, but we're almost all there. Thank you for your patience. Oh, no, no, that's fine. We're all this this whole session is sort of experimental. So I'm learning and you guys are learning. And All right, Catherine, I think we're set. Okay, okay, cool. So then I did provide you guys with these um, little selections of threads. So with this, with these quilt blocks, I'm trying to use all yellow so that when they come together, they're sort of visually cohesive. And so I've given you guys three different fibers. So um, and they're in different colors, but they different have a different hand. So one is a hand dyed cotton, one is a hand dyed silk, and one is a hand dyed linen. So just take a second and um, the linen is of course, a little coarse. <laughs> it, it's a little rougher, right? The hand, it's thinner. Um, the silk, I actually really love to do embroidery with silk and I do a lot of darning my socks with silk instead of cotton um, because I feel, I like the way it feels when I work with it, but it's also, um, silk is really strong. So this is my silk here, this bright orange piece. Your, your guys' fibers might be different because I just use what I had, but I tried to give you each the cotton fiber and silk. And then this bright one on mine is some cotton. I have this nice piece right here. It's this yellow, it's um, purple. It's got these purple little grapes. So I really like this bright, 
yellow. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna just take your thread and you're gonna unwind it. And the, a good length for embroidery is about 18 inches. So, um, yeah, Julia did a good thing. I also do, I also do this. So I take this and you take, you use your body. So I like, I put it on my, near my heart and then you have like an arms, that's a little more than 18 inches, but, um, and then you cut it there. Mm -hmm. Any longer and it gets all tangled up a lot shorter and you end up having to change your thread so much. Okay. Okay, I think I tried to give you all these like big, this is hard, I need to like zoom in. But I tried to give you all these big darning needles. What's really nice about these is they have a huge eye in which to thread your thread. <laughs> um, and they're long. So when you do darning, you need a long needle because you're essentially making cloth and weaving, which we won't be doing. But that's just a reason. So needles, you know, the right tool for the right job is always good. And so embroidery needles will be sharper, but they'll have big holes. Um, one trick is to, to thread your needle is to lick the side you're going to put through the eye. So you guys can just thread your needles. I'm going to try to do it under the camera, which is kind of hard to do. And then um, you'll just make a knot at the end. So. And then you're just going to go ahead and, and stitch if, if um, so whatever you feel comfortable in, I'm probably not going to show you guys too many stitches because we don't have, we only have about 10 minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm just, you guys can start stitching however you want to. Um, if you don't know what to do or you um, don't feel too comfortable, I would just suggest doing a straight stitch. So um, what you're going to do, I did this without even telling you, but um, what you're going to do to start is you take your needle and you start up from behind. So find the place that you want to start. What I do is I kind of put my finger where I want to go into the fabric, you know, and then you go from the back and you go up. And then you kind of start your stitching. What do I want to do? And you know, what I often do, that's really, I know quite a few stitches. I've stitched a lot, but one thing I really just love doing is I just love doing a straight stitch in one direction and just doing that over and over again. So it becomes sort of like a repetition. You can also, um, maybe you decide you wanna follow the pattern that you see on your, on, in the quilt block. Actually, I'm not gonna deal with the rip, but I have these really great, this is hard to like show you. I have these really great little purple berries that are in this print. I'm gonna make some yellow French knots, make some little yellow berries here that will go along. And just, you know, you can, especially if you're just started sewing and you don't, you don't really know like how to have your hands or just pay attention to your shoulders and try to keep your shoulders down. You can get anxious and like tense up. So just focus on 
relaxing your body when you're doing it. What's great, what's great about this project in particular is I really don't care what you do. You can do what you can stitch whatever you'd like. And if you mess up, that's okay too. This is a safe, sort of a safe textile to learn. So I'm just going to mimic the pattern here. And there's sort of these clusters of berries. So I'm doing that. You know, if you don't know what to do, a safe, a good thing, like I said, is just to do the straight stitch. And that's just when you put your needle up and down, and then you focus on the stitches being the same length. If you want to use, you know, the woman who made this quilt has these fantastic tiny little quilting stitches. You can try to sort of follow her lead and make your stitches similar sizes to hers. Very quickly, you kind of learn like how hard that is to actually do. <laughs> it takes a lot of skill and dexterity to do those really fine small stitches. Again, when you're stitching, you can sort of implement that looking practice that we did when we started, when we were just looking at our textile. But you can notice, you know, notice how the thread, if you're quiet enough, the thread like makes a sound when it's going through the fabric. You know, and, and um, different threads will behave in certain ways. I always love to notice how the thread catches the light differently than thread made from another material. Now I'm somewhere totally different than what I was going to do when I started, but that's kind of a nice thing. At any point, if you want to finish your thread or you're getting to the end of your thread, you guys probably aren't yet, which is fine. But um, do remember to leave room 
to tie off your thread. So ideally you do that in the back in the back. And so you put your thread through and I have a lot of thread here, but um, what I do is I um, make a knot with my needle and then I kind of use my finger to hold the thread down so my knot doesn't, so my knot stays tight against the fabric. even know if you can see this very well. I have a seam that's ripped here. And I'm going to do this, I'm going to attempt to do a ladder stitch. I'm sort of doing, you know, to do this demo, I'm doing this far away from my body. So it's to, to like try to let you guys see it here, which is not the ideal way you would be embroidering it sort of keeping things close. But um, with with this ladder stitch, this is a pretty way to sew a seam. And you sew on both sides where it's ripped, just inside the rip. So then when you pull it, it becomes invisible. So I'm in the purple here now, and I'm gonna go over into this. Well, it's hard to see, I'm sorry. And you know, one thing I um, always sort of encourage people to do is that if you want to start repairing your textiles, there's some basic things. If you noticed something, say you have a seam that's ripped or you have a hole in your sock, what you want to do is you want to stop wearing it. <laughs> and you, you want to put it away in a pile and you don't even have to wash it. You know, just stop using it so that you can assess the repair. And there's so many great YouTube tutorials about different ways to do mending now. It's just like this wealth of information. Um, that's what I did. I didn't even know how, I knew how to do a lot of embroidery when I started the mending sessions, but I really actually didn't even know how to darn a sock. And I learned all that by reading, you know, finding really good books about it. And I've given you guys a list of those and printed off some. Um, Julia and Emily will make sure you get them through your email. So, you know, you can have a copy. And I think I saw some physical copies too. So we'll not get to, I wish I could come, I wish I would be there and I could show you all the stitches and be right behind you guys helping you, but that's, didn't work out for right now, but um, I do wanna encourage you to just sort of, if this, is in, if this is interesting to you, there's a lot of really good resources out there. So you guys can keep stitching. And I'm going to read you something else. So this is from How to Be a Craftivist. And it, that's a book by um, 
Sarah Corbet, um, and it's called How to Be a Craftivist, The Art of Gentle Protest. She has a really fantastic um, manifesto in here that I'm going to read to you guys. Um, while you guys are stitching. Okay. A craftivist manifesto here, maybe I'll. And this was um, made with courage and care by the Craftivist Collective. They're online too, so Craftivist Collective, you can look them up. Connecting our hands, hearts, and heads, we can truly make a difference. One, be the tortoise. Breathe, take it slow. Craftivism is about taking a thoughtful approach to mindful activism. Two, craft is our tool. It can bring about effective long-term change, but it should always fit seamlessly with what we're saying and never used for the sake of it. Three, solidarity, not sympathy. Preserve the dignity of others by showing solidarity with them in your craft. Understand their struggles and you'll understand their solutions. Activism is not about charity. Four, I like this one. Find comfort in contemplation. Use the slow stitch by stitch nature of craft to help you consider the complexities of injustices. It will lead to a deeper understanding of them and their solutions. So while you're stitching slowly, be thinking about the you know the different viewpoints of injustices you know the complexities of these big problems that we are facing you know and and also these complexities within our own self too number five empathy never points fingers try to see everyone's perfect perspective everyone faces different challenges so aim to make critical friends not aggressive enemies Number six, small and beautiful. However small, pieces inspired by beauty and love can be powerful reminders of just how gorgeous the world can be. Don't worry about imperfections either. They're endearing. Seven, humility holds the key. The world often needs us to change before it can. Consider your ro role within the bigger picture. Work with people, never against them, and always keep an open mind. Number eight, provoke, don't preach. Never shout, always encourage. Inform through your craft and it will provoke thought and action. Intriguing activism inspires, never intimidates. Embrace positivity. It's the most encouraging tone we can take. Being cynical is easy, but a positive, compassionate world vision has the power to fuel dreams and build movements. 10, make the change you wish to see. If we want our world to be more beautiful, kind, and just, let's make our activism beautiful, kind, and just. So pick up your needle and thread and join us in crafting. Together we'll change our world one stitch at a time. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Oh yeah! Thank you. Well, you guys are, you know, I'm going to leave you now, I think. But you can feel free to stay and stitch together as long as, you know, Julia, you know, as long as the, the parameters are there. Um, just a little housekeeping. So if any of you want to keep those quilt blocks, you can. You, 
all of you can keep your little kits. So this, the needle with the little book and the thread and all that you can keep, even if you don't want to keep the quilt block. So this, this series of mending sessions are going to take place virtually over the next, um, from October to March. And so if you want to keep coming, keep your quilt block and all your supplies, and then um, make sure you give Julia or Emily your name and your email so then I can send you the Zoom link. We have about 25 other people already joining us um, online for these Zoom sessions, and they are going to take place the last week of every month um, until March. Um, and so you'll want to make sure, you know, you can, I can give you the link. Um, but I would love if you, if you want to keep stitching, you can. Um, and then at the end of the project or when you're done with the quilt block, um, we're going to send it all in together. And I'm really excited and quite a, quite nervous about doing these Zoom sessions online. So I'm sure they will take different forms. Um, and even too, if you guys, I thought I'd wanna encourage, you know, we can't get together all in a big room, which is what I would love to do with this project. But if a few of you do wanna keep them and continue on, please feel free to meet together safely if you would like and get to know you know the people in your room there <laughs> and just build community because another big part of this project and just the history of quilting and sewing together is that that's what it was you know it was meant to sort of combat isolation and um and to to do something meaningful together. And so, um, you know, it's, it, that's kind of scary in today's world to gather. So make sure you, you know, but if you, but if you want to get together on campus or something, I don't know, you know, um, or maybe just set up Zoom times to stitch together. I will say it is much easier to do it with just with someone else in the room, you're more likely to like institute it as a practice if you have someone else that you're going to be doing it with. And so I've found that I'm just like, okay, I'll set a date and I'll, I'll, you know, but um, I've also found it very beneficial to just stitch every day, even if it's for like five minutes. So if you keep the quilt and you want to start stitching, I just want to encourage you to jump right in and yeah you can always if you need if you want to contact me for any reason including like questions on how to do certain stitches I can point you in the right direction or um, for the duration of the project I'll also I think I'm going to be doing more formal like tutorials that I'll be videoing and have those up online um, or be sharing. There's a lots of really good resources online. So, you know, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so do look out for those, um, even if you don't wanna, you know, keep stitching. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, but ha happy, happy stitching. Have a good day. Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.